President, please be seated. Mr. President, on behalf of the United Nations and on behalf of the Cambodian people today, the Supreme Court Chamber of the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia for the prosecution of crimes committed during the period of Democratic Cambodia pronounces the final judgment on the appeals by Kiel Asamporn and the co-prosecutors in case 002-02. And we have the same judge. Morin. Bench position, except uh, Judge Morin Harin Clark, who resigned from the ECCC and the Supreme Court uh, Chamber have a reserve judge in his place. It's Judge Philip Raposa for the proceeding. Also, please inform that Judge Philip Raposa have followed the uh, procedures and the uh, proceedings at the uh, chambers during the trial a judgment as well as in the cases of 02-02-02 from the beginning. For that reason, he is full-fledged in the proceedings before us. Graffi, could you report the attendance of the parties and the council? Graffi, Mr. President and the bench, all parties are present. As for the health of the accused, accused before this morning is stable, and that he is able to uh, attend the uh, court uh, proceedings, and his health is being monitored by a medical team. Thank you. The present case, known as case 002-02, involves some of the most heinous events that occurred during one of the most tragic and catastrophic periods in human history. Between 17 April 1975 and 6 January 1979, the Communist Party of Kampuchea, CPK, also known as the Khmer Rouge, ruled Cambodia which was then known as Democratic Kampuchea, DK. After seizing power, the CPK launched a nationwide socialist revolution through a great leap forward aimed at building the country, defending it from enemies, and radically transforming the population into an atheistic and homogeneous Khmer society of broker peasants. During the DK era, the civilian population was denied basic freedoms and subjected to widespread acts of extreme cruelty. A culture of fear prevailed through mass killings, torture, violence, persecution, forced marriage, forced labor, enforced disappearances, and other inhumane treatment. The CPK's rule was met by some of the worst excesses of any regime in the 20th century, during which an estimated 1.5 
to 2 million Cambodians died. This case has been fraught with difficulties. A severance of the closing order in case 002 necessitated two consecutive trials on separate charges for the same four accused. That step was taken for trial management purposes and in light of the frail health and advanced age of all four accused. Three of those charged have since died. The majority of the case file material has been translated or interpreted into three languages. In addition to those challenges, the world was struck by the COVID-19 pandemic. This necessitated a Herculean effort, creativity, and resilience on the part of every staff member of each organ of the court. As a result, the case successfully moved forward and the uh, judgment was uh, completed. Accordingly, all procedural, factual, and legal issues subject to appeal have been duly considered and decided by all judges of the Supreme Court Chamber. Furthermore, the Chamber, mindful of the accused continued frail health and advanced age, considers it judicially prudent to ensure that the judgment is pronounced expeditiously. The judgment in this case concerns Kiel Samporn, who was found criminally responsible for his role in events involving the Khmer Rouge following a lengthy trial. The appeal judgment is several hundred pages long. I will now pronounce a summary that highlights only the key findings and rulings of the Supreme Court Chamber in its deposition of this case. The full text of the judgment will be made available in due course after the editorial and translation process is completed. Only the full written judgment is authoritative. Kiel Samporn was born in Swairing province in 1931 and had a long and significant political career in Cambodia. He became a member of the circle of the leftist Khmer intellectuals studying in, in Paris in the 1950s while pursuing university and doctoral studies in France. He eventually rose to prominence both in the run-up to and during the DK era, holding various high-level positions in the CPK, including President of the State Presidium and in the Government of DK. On 16 November 2018, the trial chamber of the ECCC rendered its judgment in case 002-02 in summary form and notified its full written judgment on 28 March 2019. In that judgment, the trial chamber found Kiev Sampon guilty of the crimes against humanity of murder, extermination, deportation, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, persecution on political, religious, and racial grounds, and other inhumane acts comprising conduct characterized as enforced disappearances, forced transfer, forced marriage, and rape in the context of forced marriage, and attacks against dignity against human dignity. Kilsen Porn was also convicted of both genocide by killing members of the Vietnamese population and grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, namely 
willful killing, torture in German treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, willfully depriving prisoners of war or civilians the rights of fair and regular trials, and the unlawful confinement of civilians. The trial chamber found that although Kirsten Pohn did not commit these crimes with his own hands, he was criminally liable for most of them as part of a joint criminal enterprise and for some of them by aiding and abetting their commission. The trial chamber imposed a sentence of life imprisonment on Kirsten Pohn merged it with the life sentence imposed on him in case 002-01 and ordered that the sentences be served concurrently. It also partially granted the civil party's request for moral and collective reparations and endorsed 13 specific communal memorial projects. Keir Sampond and the co-prosecutors filed appeal briefs and uh, separate responses, and the civil party lead co-lawyers made written submissions on behalf of the civil parties. On appeal, Keir Sampon alleges that the trial chamber committed approximately 1,824 errors and challenges the bulk of the trial judgment. In doing so, he alleges error in the issuance and pronouncement of the judgment by the trial chamber and also alleges errors relating to the fairness of the proceedings, the scope of the judicial investigation and trial, the underlying crimes, and the issue of individual criminal responsibility. He asserts that the alleged errors require that his conviction be reversed and his sentence be vacated. The Supreme Court Chamber notes, however, that Keir Sampon makes no apparent challenges to the Charles Chamber's specific findings regarding the charge of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Although his appeal cites a number of errors that called into question the general integrity of the proceedings before the trial chamber, that would also apply to its consideration of uh, that charge. His appeal relating to the grave breaches of the uh, Geneva Conventions is limited to those alleged errors. The co prosecutors advance a single ground of appeal, challenging the trial chamber's ruling that forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage did not constitute the crime against humanity of other inhuman acts in the case of male victims. The Supreme Court Chamber heard the party's oral submissions on the appeals from 16 to 19 August 2021. The chamber then retired to deliberate, deliberate and today it renders its judgment on both appeals, which I shall address together as is done in the full written judgment. Due to the significant number of appeal challenges raised by Kiel and Porn, at this hearing I shall pronounce only a summary of our findings and rulings along with the disposition. The Supreme Court Chamber's findings and rulings with respect to both appeals are set out in its full written judgment, which will be notified in due course. 
I reiterate that it is the full written judgment that is authoritative, a summary of the challenges on appeal uh, address sequentially as follows, alleged errors related to fairness of proceedings. As a preliminary matter, Kiesem Porn contends that by failing to issue the full written judgment on the day that it was announced in a summary form, the trial chamber committed a serious error of law that rendered the pronouncement of the judgment procedurally defective and thus void. Moreover, he argues that the subsequent issuance of the full written judgment did not cure the defect. He asserts that the trial judges were functions of issue when the full written judgment was notified and that the rest of his appeal is therefore rendered most moot because his guilt or innocence was never lawfully adjudicated. The Supreme Court Chamber notes that Keir Sampon was fully aware of the trial chamber's intention to deliver a summary of the judgment with a full written judgment to follow. The trial chamber publicly uh, provided notice of its intention to do so and provided ample opportunity to the parties to raise any objections and uh, none were raised. Internal rule 1021 provides that judgments shall be issued and announced during a public hearing and that a summary of the findings and the disposition shall be read aloud by the president or the judge of the chamber. The same rule also provides that the greffier shall distribute a copy of the judgment to the parties and ensure that it is published by the Office of Administration by appropriate means. Noting in this rule specifies, however, that such distribution or publication of the judgment must take place on the same day as the public hearing. In fact, it is not uncommon in international criminal cases of such magnitude to uh, issue an oral summary of the judgment with written reasons to follow to allow for completion of the editorial and or translation processes. A trial judgment was thus lawfully issued and announced on 16 November 2018 in a summary form, although the full written version was distributed and published on 28 March 2019. Kiel supports right to review the judgment underpinning both his convictions and his sentence remained wholly intact pending the distribution and publication of the uh, judgment as evidenced by the present adjudication of his appeal against the trial chamber's uh, judgment. His submission in this respect is accordingly dismissed. Case Porn further submits that over the course of the trial proceedings in case 002-02, his fundamental rights as recognized under the legal framework of the ECCC have not been respected as a result of the trial chamber's bias approach to the guiding principles of criminal proceedings and the rule of evidence. He argues that this fundamentally flawed approach led the trial chamber to repeatedly violate the majority of his fair trial rights 
and prevented it from making its findings and rulings in a fair and reasonable manner, resulting in numerous errors during the trial. His allegations of bias further extends to the trial chamber severance of case 002. He argues that the cumulative effect of these errors rendered the entire trial unfair, and he asked the Supreme Court chamber to reverse his convictions and his sentence. The Supreme Court chamber notes that, with respect to his claim of a bias on the part of the trial chamber, Kisampon repeats his previous allegation that the case 00201 trial judgment prejudge his guilt in case 002-02, asserting that it would be impossible for the trial chamber to ignore its verdict in the previous case when deciding how to adjudicate the subsequent one. These are not novel issues and have previously been the subject of Kiel Sampon's application for disqualification of the trial and Supreme Court judges in 2014 and in 2019, respectively. A specially appointed panel of judges fully considered and dismissed the allegations of bias. In the absence of new substantiated allegations sufficient to rebut the judges' presumption of imp impartiality, these claims of bias are summarily dismissed. Case upon additional allegations that the trial chamber was not impartial as to the manner in which it examined the evidence and committed other violations of his fair trial rights and the fairness of the proceedings are similarly dismissed as being without foundation for reasons explained in the full written judgment. <coughs> Alleged errors related to the scope of the judicial investigation and trial. Turning to his allegations concerning Sai Sin, here some point raises five main challenges relating to the scope of the judicial investigation and trial, namely that the trial chamber heard by one, characterizing his request relating to the scope of the investigation as related preliminary objections under Rule 89 and finding them inadmissible. Two, dismissing his arguments concerning the insufficiency of the charges against him due to their lack of clarity. Three, ignoring his arguments that it could not adjudicate facts that were not accepted and not legally qualified by the co-investigating charges causing it to exceed the scope of its referral. Four, delivering a judgment on facts that it had already adjudicated in case 002-01 or on facts that it excluded from case 002-02 and for which the proceedings were terminated, and five, considering the out of scope but relevant evidence about facts of which it was not seized. I will summarize the report chamber findings regarding those five challenges sequentially. Concerning his first argument, the Supreme Court Chamber agrees with the co-prosecutors that since Kirsten Paul challenges the assessment of the trial chamber based on the alleged defects in the closing order, 
and not the jurisdiction of the ECCC itself, his challenges do not fall within the remit of absolute jurisdiction and are thus subject to queue through adequate notice of the charges. Accordingly, the trial chamber did not err in holding that Q Sampon's objections were subject to the deadline prescribed by Internal Rule 89.1. As to his second argument, for reasons explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court Chambers finds no error in the trial chamber's dismissal of his submission concerning the insufficiency of the charges against him due to the alleged lack of clarity. Regarding his third argument, the Supreme Court Chamber finds that the trial chamber did not err in law in determining its sentient of the facts contained in the closing order. It has considered Kiel Sampon's arguments concerning the scope of the trial chamber's referral and finds that he has not demonstrated any error on the part of the trial chamber for reasons explained in the full written judgment. Relative to his fourth argument, the Supreme Court Chamber is not persuaded that the trial chamber erred by delivering a judgment on facts that it had already adjudicated in case 002-01 or on facts that it excluded from case 002-02 and for which the proceedings were terminated for reasons explained in the full written judgment. Finally, as to his fifth argument that the trial chamber erred in law by taking a historical approach to considering the out of scope but relevant evidence about facts of which it was not seized, the Supreme Court chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's conclusion that it may rely on the evidence outside the temporal or geographic scope of the closing order for the limited purposes of clarifying a given context, establishing by inference the elements of criminal conduct occurred, occurring during the material period or demonstrating a deliberate pattern of a conduct, alleged errors related to the underlying crimes. I will now turn to the findings relevant to the substance of the case against Kier Sampon, namely the crimes of which he was convicted murder as a crime against humanity. The chamber observes that the trial chamber applied a mentoria standard of bullies eventually when assessing the facts relevant to the crime against humanity or murder as it did in case 002-01. And as this chamber upheld on appeal in that case, his important argues that this standard was incorrect, claiming it did not exist in customary international law in 1975, and further, that such a definition was not foreseeable or accessible to him at uh, that time. The Supreme Court chamber disagrees and concludes that the trial chamber did not err. Kisampon asserts that the trial chamber erred in a finding that murder as a crime against humanity was established at Trump co cooperatives, Japan Tmall Damned Worksite, 1st January Damned Worksite, and Kampong Chenang Airfield Construction Site, based partly on culpable omissions without first finding that there was a duty to act. 
The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that the trial chamber did not err. As to whether murder was established at the following sites. Number one, Chamka cooperatives. Kilson Pond argues that the trial chamber erred, in fact, by finding that there were deaths due to starvation and rudimentary medical care at Trump co cooperatives, and erred in finding that the requisite level of intent had been established. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilson Porn has failed to demonstrate an error on the part of the trial chamber. Trump the Pantmore Dam worksite, Kisampon argues that the trial chamber erred in assessing whether the authority acted with the requisite level of intent concerning the deaths at the Pantmore Dam worksite, as there were factors beyond their control that could have led to the conditions causing death at that location. The Supreme Court Chamber has analyzed his arguments and the trial chamber's findings and concludes that Kirsten Pond has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Number three, first, dam, first January dam work site. Kirsten Pond argues that the trial chamber erred in finding that murders had occurred at the 1st January dam work site due to the living and working conditions imposed, including the lack of medicine, and that workers died due to accidents. He also argues that the trial chamber erred in finding that the perpetrators knew there was a lack of sufficient food and medicine, but nevertheless continues to push the workers to complete the work. The Supreme Court Chambers concludes that Kilson Pond has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Four. Kampong Chunang Airfield Construction Site. Kilson Pond argues that the trial chamber erred in finding that the deaths due to the conditions imposed were committed with the requisite level of intent because there were factors beyond their control that could have caused the underlying condition causing death at that location. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilson Pond has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Five, Plum Crowd Security Center. The trial chamber found that two deaths occurred at Plum Crowd Security Center that amount to a murder as a crime against humanity. The first involved an inmate named Hus, who the trial chamber found had been killed by prison guards. The second involved an inmate named Tu, who died as a result of the poor conditions of the tension he experienced. Kilson Pond argues that the trial chamber erred by finding that both of these murders had been established beyond reasonable doubt. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that the trial chamber erred in its finding concerning the deaths of Hertz and Tui as they were clearly based on the written statements of deceased witnesses who Kilson Pond was unable to confront accordingly. We reverse the trial chamber's findings concerning the crime against humanity of murder at Nom Grau Security Center. Extermination as a crime against humanity. Extermination of the charm. 
The trial chamber found that murder as a crime against humanity was established in relation to intentional killings of Jam at the Wat O Dokun Security Center in 1977 and the Trier Village Security Center in 1978. It was unable to establish a definite number of victims, but was certified that a great number of Jam civilians were taken to and killed at both security centers. It found that these murders certify the requirement of killings on a massive scale and formed part of the same and a murder operation. The trial chamber determined that the crime against humanity of extermination subsumed that of murder and entered a conviction only for extermination. Kills and pawn challenges the sufficiency of the evidence that killings occurred at the village and, and, and at what Otokun. However, the Supreme Court Chamber does not consider the trial chamber's findings to be unreasonable. He further challenges whether a numerical, numerical threshold for extermination had been met since the trial chamber was unable to establish a definite number of victims. But the Supreme Court chamber concludes that the facts support the trial chamber's determination that killings on a massive scale occurred. Finally, Kirsumpon challenges whether there was, an, there was intent to kill on a large scale, but the Supreme Court Chamber discerns no error in the trial chamber's findings. Extermination of the Vietnamese. Kiu Sun Pong alleges multiple factual and legal errors in the trial chamber's findings with respect to the killing of Vietnamese in Svai Rieng, in DK Waters, in Kampung Chang province, at Wat Sat, and in Krache as well as at all consigned security centers, submitting that the crime against humanity of murder and extermination could not be established in relation to any of these killings. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilsom Pond has failed to demonstrate that the trial chamber urged in finding that killings occurred at the above-mentioned locations. As to whether they amounted to extermination, the Supreme Court chamber discerns no error in the trial chamber's aggregation of the killings committed in multiple areas due to its finding that they were part of the same murder operation. Enslavement as a crime against humanity. Kirsten Pong challenges whether enslavement as a crime against humanity occurred at Phnom Krao Security Center, alleging that the trial chamber was only seized of enslavement at one location known as K-11 within Phnom Krao Security Center and that the evidence of enslavement at K-11 was insufficient. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilsen Pond has failed to demonstrate any error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to this issue. Deportation as a crime against humanity. The trial chamber found Kilsen Pons guilty of the crime against humanity of deportation of the Vietnamese from Tang Cooperatives and from Prey Province. 
kills upon challenges the chamber's conclusion that the Vietnamese were deported from Tram Kok cooperatives across a national border as well as from Pre Vang. He also challenges the trial chamber's finding that there was an intent to deport the Vietnamese. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that Kim Sung Pong has failed to demonstrate any error on the part of the trial chamber. Torture as a crime against humanity. Kim Sung Pong challenges the sufficiency of the evidence relied upon by the trial chamber to establish the crime against humanity of torture of the Jam at Tria village. The Supreme Court Chamber discerns no error on the part of the trial chamber and concludes that Kirsten Pond has failed to demonstrate that his finding that Jam were the torture was one that no reasonable trial of facts of fact rather could make. Persecution as a crime against humanity. Kirsten Pond asserts that under customary international law in 1975, persecution as a crime against humanity required an objective to remove the targeted persons from the community in which they live alongside the perpetrators or even from human, human society in itself. In the case 001 appeal judgment, the Supreme Court chamber addressed this issue and concluded that such an objective was not an element of persecution under customary international law in 1975. Kirsten Pond, however, argues a departure from our previous ruling, which was based on analysis of post-World War II jurisprudence. This we declined to do. Consequently, Kilsom Pond has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Kilsom Pond also alleges that the trial chamber erred in law by characterizing undifferentiated treatment that has a particular impact on a class of individual as discrimination in fact. He argues that indirect discrimination is a recent human rights concept that was not considered discrimination in fact in customary international law in 1975. With respect to this claim, the Supreme Court Chamber concludes in summary as follows. Political persecution of the Jam. The trial chamber found that the Jam were targeted on political grounds and were dispersed to break up their communities. Kilsom Fon challenges this finding, claiming that the trial chamber failed to establish that the population transfers affected the Jam exclusively or at least. Prelim, uh, prelim, uh, primarily and were therefore discriminatory. Similarly, Kilsom Pond claims that the evidence fails to establish that in the course of the transfer, the Jam were treated differently from others, which he asserted was the test the trial chamber used in K002-01 concerning new people, quote, unquote. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that Kilsom Pond has misinterpreted his, its jurisprudence in K002-01. It finds that the trial chamber applied the correct legal test to determine whether persecution occurred. Kilsom Pond also challenges whether the mansria was properly established by the trial chamber, claiming that there were non-discriminatory 
discriminatory grounds for the movement of the jam. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that his arguments fail to demonstrate that the trial chamber's findings with respect to this issue was unreasonable. Kirsten Pond further submits that the trial chamber erred in its assessment as to whether the severity of the discrimi discriminatory acts amounts to persecution. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that the acts rise to the requisite level of severity to amount to political persecution as a crime against humanity. Kirsten Pond's arguments concerning political persecution of the jam are dismissed. Political persecution of other real or perceived enemies, quote unquote. Kirsten challenges the discernibility of the targeted group of real or perceived enemies of the CPK, quote unquote, in relation to the findings of political persecution at S21 and all consigned security centers. The Supreme Court Chamber addressed this issue in K001 and K002 slash 01 and concluded that political persecution was understood as encompassing situation where the perpetrators designated targeted groups in broad strokes without inquiry into the political views held by the individuals concerned. It, quote, thus confirmed the possibility that per persecution as a crime against humanity might target aggregated groups without any common identity or agenda, agenda unquote. Accordingly, the Supreme Court Chamber rejects Kirsten argument that, quote, real or perceived enemies of the CBK, unquote, is not a sufficiently discernible group for a finding of political persecution. Political persecution at cooperatives and security centers. Number one, Trump co cooperatives. Kilson Paul argues that the evidence was insufficient to find that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials and new people were persecuted at the Trump co cooperatives on political grounds. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilson Paul has failed to demonstrate any error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to this issue. Two, the Bank Mall Dam work site. Kilson Paul submits that the only acts of persecution in question at the Bank Mall Dam work site were the exclusion of new people from leadership positions and their being monitored by base people which he argues is insufficient to find that any fundamental rights were violated or that the gravity requirements to constitute persecution as a crime against humanity was satisfied. Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kirsten Paul has failed to demonstrate any error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to this issue. Three, first January dam work site. Kilson Pond argues that the trial chamber erred in fact by concluding that there was discrimination against people at the first January dam work site. Two, erred in law by asserting that there was a fundamental right to equal treatment. And three, Three, erred in law and in fact by finding that the treatment violated the fundamental right of new people to equal treatment. And four, erred in law by failing to set out the requisite level of gravity that needed to be met for the underlying acts to be characterized, characterized as persecution.
as explained in the full written judgment, the court chamber, the court at the Supreme Court chamber concludes that the trial chamber erred in finding that during the relevant time period there was a fundamental right to equal treatment led down in international customary or treaty law that had been infringed or violated and accordingly reverses case upon conviction for political persecution against new people at the first January dam work site. Kilsampon also argues that there was insufficient evidence to find that former Republic soldiers and officials were persecuted on political grounds at the first January dam work site. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilsampon has failed to demonstrate any error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to this issue. Four, S21 Security Center. Kilsampon argues that the trial chamber erred in findings that the acts directed at, quote, real or perceived enemies of the CPK, unquote, were discriminate, discriminatory in fact, and claiming that the massive scale of, of the arrest show that they were indiscriminate. He argues that in K001, the Supreme Court chamber reversed the trial chamber's finding on persecution on political grounds, since it found that no discernible criteria were applied in targeting the victims. Kirsten asserts that the evidence in case 002-02 evinced nothing new that would support a different findings in this case. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that the fact that people were arrested en masse does not preclude a finding of persecution on political grounds as long as members of the targeted group were arrested because they belong to the targeted group. The Supreme Court Chamber's reversal of the eviction of persecution on political grounds in K-001 was specific to Kilsampon has not demonstrated that the trial chamber erred in finding that the acts were discriminatory. Five, Okamsang Security Center. Kilsampon claims that the trial chamber erred in finding that political persecution occurred at Okamsang Security Center, arguing mainly that the evidence relied on does not show discriminatory treatment. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilsampon has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Religious persecution. The trial chamber made legal findings with respect to persecution on religious grounds in two sections of the trial judgment. The first specifically in relation to the treatment of the jam at the first January dam work site, and the second in relation to the treatment of the jam generally. Concerning the first January dam work site, the trial chamber found that jam workers suffered discrimination because they were forced to eat pork, prevented from worshipping, and prevented from speaking their native language. In relation to the treatment of the jam generally, the trial chamber found that the restrictions and the cultural restrictions were imposed included prohibition on daily prayers, forcing jam to eat pork, forcing jam to wear the same dress and haircuts as the Khmer people, forcing jam to speak only the Khmer language and burning Korans and dismantling mosques 
or causing them for non-religious purposes. It was certified that these restrictions were discriminatory and were deliberately perpetrated with the intent to discriminate against the Jam because of their religious and cultural practices. Kirsonporn challenges the sufficiency of the evidence that certain persecutory acts occurred at the 1st January Dam work site and elsewhere in Cambodia. He also, he also argues that the trial chamber erred by failing to consider whether the restriction on freedom of the religion were permissible in law. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that Kirsten has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to these issues. Kirsten Pond argues that the persecutory acts did not discriminate because they were applied equally to everyone. The Supreme Court chamber considers that the discrimination, in fact, can occur when there are unequal consequences for a particular group of an act or omission of, of general application. The Supreme Court chamber has, does not discern any error in the trial chamber's conclusion that the jam were, quote, predominantly and particularly affected, unquote, by the religious and cultural restrictions so as to establish discrimination in fact. Case upon argues that the trial chamber erred in finding that there had been a breach of fundamental rights as none of the religious and cultural restrictions breached any of the rights the trial chamber referred to in its legal finding, noting that the trial chamber did not find that the right to freedom of religion had been breached as regards the treatment of Jam generally, but only at the first January Dam work site. The Supreme Court Chamber notes that the trial chamber stated that the right to personal dignity was violated by the re religious and cultural restriction at issue and considers this finding to be reasonable. Accordingly, the Supreme Court Chamber rejects Kilsom Pond's arguments. Kisambon also challenges whether there was intent to discriminate on religious grounds. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kisambon has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber with, the res with respect to this issue. The trial chamber found that the crime against humanity of religious persecution against the Buddhists was established at the Drumcock cooperatives. In particular, it found that over 100 Buddhist monks were deliberately gathered at Ong Roka Pagoda and forced to the Prague. It considered that references to monks as, quote, worms, unquote, or, quote, leeches, or, unquote, and announcements dismissing Buddhism as mere superstition, superstition and the Buddha as only concrete, quote, unquote, demonstrated the discriminatory inten intention behind the process. The trial chamber further found that the Buddhist symbols were destroyed and pagodas used for a range of non-religious purposes across Tramkok district. It concluded that the evidence revealed a complete abolition of Buddhist practices constituting an, quote, organized and sustained attack against religion, religion, unquote, which was considered to be incompatible with the implementation of the revolution. Based on these considerations, the trial chamber conclude 
that the physical and mental impact of these events in infringed fundamental rights to a degree of gravity similar to that of other crimes against humanity. Kilsompon submits that the trial chamber erred in finding that the religious persecution had been established, claiming there was a lack of evidence regarding the physical or mental effects of the alleged acts of persecution against Buddhists. Moreover, he asserts that because there was no evidence of discriminatory treatment against Buddhist monks and Buddhists, they were treated like the rest of the population. The Supreme Court Chamber disagrees and concludes that Kirsten has not demonstrated any error on the part of the trial chamber with respect to these issues. Racial persecution. The trial chamber found that the crimes against humanity of racial persecution of Vietnamese was established at tram co cooperatives, S21 Security Center, or Consign Security Center, and in Preveng and Swairing. It found that this crime was committed as part of a policy of targeting Vietnamese for adverse treatment throughout the decay period, in particular for deportation before April 1977 and for destruction as a racial group thereafter. Because the Vietnamese were considered to be the DK's most dangerous enemy, Kirsten challenges whether racial persecution occurred at any of the above mentioned sites. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kirsten Porn has failed to demonstrate error on the part of the trial chamber. Other inhumane acts as crimes against humanity. Kirsten Porn challenges whether the trial chamber properly assessed the principle of legality when it found that it was both foreseeable and accessible in general that other inhuman acts were punishable as crimes against humanity by 1975. According to him, it is not enough to say that other inhuman acts were foreseeable since this category can cover numerous types of behavior. Rather, he asserts that the trial chamber should have identified the behavior at issue and examined whether it could have defined as criminal at the time. The Supreme Court Chamber is of the view that Kiel Sampon misunderstands the application of the principle of legality with regard to other inhumane acts. What is required is that the category of other inhumane acts be foreseeable and accessible to the accused, which the trial chamber found in this case. Consequently, there was no error. Kielsen Porn also asserts that conduct must breach a specific prohibition set out in human rights instruments to amount to an inhumane act. In case 002-01, the Supreme Court Chamber subscribed to the approach taken by the ICTY Kupreskik Trial Chamber of relating other inhuman acts to conduct infringing basic rights 
appertaining to human beings as identified under international legal instruments. The Syrian Court Chamber explained, however, that it is not required that the particular conduct must be expressly criminalized under international law, as this would render the concepts of other in human acts as a residual category unnecessary. Case and Pons submission in this regard is accordingly dismissed. Enforced disappearances. Case and Pons challenges the trial chamber's findings that conduct characterized as enforced disappearances was established at Tram Co Cooperatives, Krang Tachan Security Center, and Phnom Krao Security Center. For reasons explained more fully in the judgment, the Sirim Court Chamber concludes that the trial chamber properly established that the crime against the humanity of other inhuman acts through conduct characterized as enforced disappearances occurred in Tramco and at Krang Pachan and Phnom Krao. Forced marriage. The trial chamber found that the regulation of marriage was one of the CPK's policies designed and implemented to achieve a socialist revolution in Cambodia. This policy involved the commission of the crimes against humanity of other inhuman acts that occurred through conduct characterized by the chamber as forced marriage and raped in the context of forced marriage. The trial chamber thus found Kiel Sampon guilty of committing these other inhuman acts as crimes against humanity through a joint criminal enterprise. Kisampon objects to his convictions for these crimes with respect to the regulation of marriage policy. Arguing a violation of the principle of legality, disputing factual findings, and challenging the seriousness of the behavior. The co prosecutors, in turn, appealed the trial chamber's ruling, which effectively excluded males as victims of forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage. Forced marriage and rape in the context of forced marriage. Case and Paul argues that the trial chamber erred in relying on the international criminal case law to determine the legality of forced marriage in allegedly failing to ascertain whether the conduct violated basic rights in failing to consider the alleged lawfulness of forced marriage under Cambodian and other domestic regimes in 1975-1979 and in allegedly failing to properly consider the principle of a justem generis in assessing the competitive gravity of forced marriage in other conflicts. As explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court Chamber rejects all of these arguments. Kiss and Paul further argues that the trial chamber erred in how it treated rape in the context of forced marriage. The co prosecutors in turn, have appealed what they assert to be errors in the trial chamber's approach with respect to male victims of forced intercourse in the context of forced marriage.
Specifically, they cite the trial chamber's findings on the elements of other inhuman acts with regard to a conduct charged as raped in the context of a forced marriage, arguing that the trial chamber failed to make proper findings with respect to the experience of male victims of this crime. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that the trial chamber erred in its identification of the element of rape in its analysis. Rather, the chamber should have only considered the charged conduct that had occurred being acts of forced sexual intercourse between male and female victims who had been forcibly married. This chamber further finds that such forced acts violated the basic rights of physical integrity and human dignity applicable in 1975-1979 and are of comparable gravity. We thus conclude that this conduct properly described as forced sexual intercourse in the context of a forced marriage fell within the scope of crimes against humanity of other inhumane acts. The Supreme Court Chamber thus clarifies that the victims of forced sexual intercourse comprise both female and male victims. Pursuant to our analysis, we uphold the co-prosecutor's appeal regarding errors in the trial chamber's approach to male victims. The nature and implementation of the marriage policy keeps upon raises various factual challenges to the trial chamber's findings on the purposes of marriage policy, namely population increase and the control of sexual interactions. He also alleges a contradiction between those two goals and asserts that to restrict male-female sexual interactions conflicts with the desire to increase the population. Kirsten also disputes the trial chamber's finding that the CPK principle of consent to marriage was not applied in a practice, as well as findings about both marriages of disabled soldiers and wedding ceremonies. The Supreme Court chamber rejects all of these arguments for reasons explained in the full written judgment. As also more fully explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court Chamber similarly rejects Kirsten Pond's assertion that there was no policy of forced sexual intercourse, as well as his denial that sexual intercourse was compelled. Kirsten Pond also disputes the trial chamber's findings regarding instructions from the upper echelon to arrange marriages, reports on marriage to the upper echelon, and reports on monitoring the consummation of marriages, as well as his own personal involvement in the uh, regulation of marriage. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that, for the most part, Kirsten Paul mischaracterizes both the trial chamber, the trial judgment, and the evidence with respect to these merit matters. His submissions are therefore dismissed. The legal findings on the element of other inhumane acts. The trial chamber found that the conduct charged as forced marriage and the conduct charged as rape in forced marriage had occurred. 
With regards to forced marriage, it considered that serious mental or physical suffering was inflicted on individuals through the threat of, force, of forcing them to marry strangers and the fear instilled to pressure them to consummate the uh, marriage and found that the conduct was performed intentionally. The trial, cham the trial chamber was therefore satisfied that the conduct characterized as forced marriage was established and uh, met the threshold of other inhumane acts. Uh, please take the accused to the uh, restroom, and we will pause momentarily, and we will resume the uh, pronouncement of the judgment when he returns. The court is now in session. With regard to the conduct charge as raped in the context of forced marriage, the trial chamber found that rape had occurred with regard to female uh, victims and had caused serious mental or physical suffering or injury. Consequently, Consequently, in the manner of that, it affected female victims. Such forced sexual intercourse also constitute tit and inhumane act. However, with regard to male victims of forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage, the trial chamber concluded that uh, given the circumstances, they could not be considered raped victims. The trial chamber then considered whether the male victims had experienced another act of sexual violence of comparable gravity. It concluded that while the male victims indeed had experienced sexual violence that had breached their human dignity, there was insufficient evidence concerning the extent of its impact on them. Accordingly, the trial chamber concluded that the elements of other in human acts as crimes against humanity were, were not established with respect to the male victims of forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage. The Supreme Court chamber has reviewed the evidence that was before the trial chamber and concludes that it was in fact sufficient to support the conclusion that male victims experience an impact comparable to that which female victims experience when forced to engage in intercourse in the context of forced marriage. It follows that such forced sexual intercourse also constituted an injury acts as to the male victims, a factor that we have also considered in upholding the co prosecutor's appeal regarding the trial chamber's approach to male victims. Case and Porn, in turn, asserts that the trial chamber erred in the findings it made on the actual serious of forced marriage in failing to consider the context of traditional arranged marriages, which he asserts were akin to marriages under the CPK, and in the findings it made on serious mental or physical suffering or injury in the case of various individuals.
The Supreme Court Chamber rejects each of these assertions. Furthermore, there was no merit to any of Kisampon's challenges to evidence attesting to individual experiences of harm. Kisampon raised alternative inferences not supported by the evidence, misrepresented the evidence, mischaracterized the trial judgment, or simply disagreed with the trial chamber's findings without demonstrating any error. Kisampon next challenges the trial chamber's findings with respect to the female victims of conduct charge as raped in the context of forced marriage. The Supreme Court chamber discerns no error in the findings of the trial chamber in this regard. The co-prosecutors, in turn, also challenges the trial chamber's findings, but with respect to male victims in the context of conduct charged as raped in the context of forced marriage. The Supreme Court chamber recalls its finding that the trial chamber erred in attempting to identify the elements of rape with the respect to male victims, but instead should have considered only whether the charge conduct of forced sexual intercourse had occurred in the context of forced marriage. Having reviewed the evidence that was before the trial chamber, we conclude that it was sufficient to support the conclusion that uh, the charge conduct of forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced uh, marriage did, in fact, occur. Kirsten Paul argues that the trial chamber erred in its findings on harm experienced by a number of female victims and also alleges error in the failure to consider certain other evidence. This chamber considers both of these arguments to be without merit. Indeed, Kirsten Paul misrepresents the evidence or merely disagrees with the trial chamber's findings without demonstrating any error. Genocide. The trial chamber found that the Vietnamese constituted a protected racial, national, and ethnic group during the indictment period. After determining that a number of Vietnamese were, were among the victims of the crimes against humanity of murder and uh, extermination, and that the CPK targeted them because they were uh, Vietnamese, with the intent to uh, destroy the group, the trial chamber was satisfied that genocide had been established. Kirsten Paul contends that the trial chamber erred in concluding that the killings of Vietnamese occurred or that the killings at Okonsai at S21 and in Cambodian territorial waters including at Old Port, were of members of the protected group. He argues that the trial chamber erred in failing to determine whether there was an intent to destroy the protected group in whole or in part, as well as whether there was an intent to destroy the protected group. The Supreme Court chamber discerns no error in the trial chamber's findings concerning the killing of Vietnamese in Swai Rieng, BK Waters, 
Kampung Chenang Province, Worksite and Krati. The chamber also concludes that the chamber also concludes that the trial chamber accurately set out the applicable law as it relates to genocide. Moreover, in determining that the man's rear of genocide by killing was established, the trial chamber properly relied on factors in addition to the scale of the atrocities such as the existence of a policy of targeting the Vietnamese for adverse treatment in DK throughout the relevant period. The Supreme Court chamber does finds no merit in Q. Sampon's arguments regarding genocide and rejects them as further explained in the full written judgment. Alleged errors relating to individual criminal responsibility. Q. Sampon's roles and responsibility during the DK period. Kim Sampon challenges the trial chamber's findings about his roles and responsibilities during the DK. Many of these findings, combined with other evidence, underpin the trial chamber's finding about his JCE contribution, intent, and knowledge. The Supreme Court Chamber has determined that the vast majority of Kyo Pong's arguments are unfounded. He merely advances an alternative reading of the facts, one that cherry-picks the evidence and ignores large swaths of relevant evidence and fails to demonstrate that the trial chamber's assessment of the evidence was unreasonable. Grung, Deputy Prime Minister and President of the State Presidium. The Supreme Court Chamber upholds the trial chamber's finding that as a Grung, Deputy Prime Minister, Kim Sompon promoted the CPK's agenda by reading press communiques open April 1975, Special National Congress and December 1975, Third National Congress. Then the trial chamber was unable to determine whether these events actually took place in is immaterial to the undisputed facts that Kim Song Pong read the communiques for radio broadcast and that these promoted to the party line. The Supreme Court Chamber dismisses Kim Song Pong's argument that the trial chamber could not rely on his conduct as president of the state presidium because this role was largely symbolic, quote-unquote, as he misapprehends the import of the trial chamber's description. It also dismisses Kilson Pong's argument that the trial chamber is the trial chamber ignored evidence that the CPK mistrusted him. The Supreme Court Chamber also rejects his repeated, repeated uh, arguments that he could not contribute to the common purpose by exercising diplomatic duties and generally, and generally by promoting the CPK party line in his speeches because he says this was not criminal in and of itself, quote unquote, or he supported only benign activities. The trial chamber's findings amply demonstrate that Kilson Pong's speeches promoted a variety of the CPK's criminal policies.
While the Supreme Court Chamber agrees with Kim Sung Pong that the trial chamber erred by attributing to him a speech at the first session of the People's Representative Assembly, and these errors did not, did, not, did not occasion a miscarriage of justice as they were not indispensable to the trial chamber's corresponding conclusions. Membership in the Central Committee. Kilsompon concedes that he was first an alternate member and then a full member, quote unquote, of the Central Committee. In his view, the trial chamber erred by one, overstating the powers of the Central Committee, two, attributing decisions of the Standing Committee to the Central Committee, three, conveniently, quote unquote, dating Kirsompon's admission as a full member of the Central Committee in order to implicate him in the Central Committee decision of the 30th of March 1976, and for finding that he participated in party congresses. The Supreme Court Chamber rejects these arguments for the reasons explained in the full written judgment. The Supreme Court Chamber accepts his argument that not all telegrams sent to party center reached all the Central Committee's members, but concludes he was well informed by virtue of his membership in Office 870. The Supreme Court Chamber has also considered Kyo Sampon's submissions with respect to four decisions of the Central Committee. One, the May 1972 decision to close markets and the use of money and organized cooperatives in the liberated zones. Two, the mid-1974 decision to close the door to party membership in order to prevent spies from infiltrating the party. Three, the June 1974 decision to undertake, to undertake the final assault and evacuation of Phnom Penh in the dry season of 1974-1975. And four, the 30th of March 1976 decision of the Central Committee regarding a number of matters. This chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's findings or in its conclusion that Kim Sompon was aware of the first three of these decisions, which is solidly grounded in the evidence. The chamber discerns no error in the trial chamber's findings that the Central Committee appointed Kim Sompon to the role of president of the state presidium. We similarly see no reason to disturb the trial chamber's finding that Kim Sung Pong contributed to the common purpose by assenting to the contents of that decision. Moreover, the conclusion of the trial chamber that he did attend the fourth and the fifth party congresses was supported by the evidence. Attendance and participation in meetings of the Standing Committee. The Chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's conclusion that Kim Sompong's frequent attendance at meetings of the Standing Committee accorded him, accorded him quote, a position of unique standing unquote, within the party. He merely advances an alternative interpretation of the evidence and repeats arguments from cases 002-01 rather, and case 002-02 without demonstrating that the trial chamber's conclusion was unreasonable.
Kilson Pond's argument that the trial chamber erred by holding him responsible based on his participation in meetings of the standing committee are unfounded. Contrary to his submissions, the trial chamber did not extrapolate from him, from Kirsten Pond's active participation in two meetings that he participated on other occasions or took part in decision making and did not hold him responsible on this basis. Kirsten Pond challenges the trial chamber's finding that he contributed to the common plan by attending standing committee meetings discussing Kampung Chitang airfield. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that the trial chamber erred in finding that he attended the meeting on 9 of October 1975, but this error did not occasion a miscarriage of justice. This chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's characterization of the evidence pertaining to the two other meetings discussing Kampong Chinang airfield. The Supreme Court chamber also finds no error in the trial chamber's reliance inter alia on a statement by the late Ian Sari to find that Kim Song Pon attended a meeting of the standing committee in September 1975, where, quote, agriculture, drought, and industry, unquote, were discussed. Kirsten Pond argues that the trial chamber erred by relying on democratic centralism to find that he could have intervened in the central and standing committee's meetings. The Supreme Court chamber concludes that the trial chamber did not rely on democratic centralism to hold Kiel Sampong responsible for central committee decisions, but on his full membership in that body. The chamber sees no error in that approach, as the trial chamber did not find that Kiel Sampong actively participated in standing committee meetings, his submission that he could not intervene in such meetings is moved. Residual functions. Kim Song Pong challenges the trial chamber's reliance on evidence of I am Un and I Hain to find that he spoke about enemies during political training sessions held at Boregela K6 and the Khmer Soviet Friendship Institute of Technology K15. The Supreme Court Chamber has reviewed the evidence and finals error in the trial chamber assessment. This chamber rejects Kilsom Pond's admissions that the trial chamber ignored other evidence from witnesses whose amount support the conclusion, whose account rather, support the conclusion that he was involved in po politic training. It dismisses his argument that statements, quote, relating to the CPK's general economic project, unquote, could constitute a significant contribution to the JCE. The Supreme Court Chamber dismisses the submission of Kirsten Paul that the trial chamber erred in finding that he joined that office 870 in October 1975. He repeats arguments rejected by this chamber in case 002-01, and which fails to persuade us that the trial chamber Third, second, this chamber rejects Gilson Pond's assertion, assertion that the trial chamber exaggerated the evidence concerning his role in Office 870. 
Kirsten Pond disputes the trial chamber's findings about his role in the indicate trade and commerce. A number of similar challenges were dismissed by this chamber in case 002 slash 01. Since he merely advances an alternative interpretation of the evidence, Kilson Pond portrays himself, himself as having played a minor technical role in the, cent in the Commerce Committee. These submissions are similarly dismissed. The Supreme Court Chamber finds no error in the trial chamber's reliance on the evidence of Sorkum Lamut, alias Sorkum Lamut, and Yen Kuch, and Biet Buen, alias Biet Na. The Supreme Court Chamber did not consider it unreasonable that the trial chamber concluded that Kirsopon would have been aware of the contents of the two of two letters sent to him by Amnesty International in 1977 and 1978, in part due to his connection to both the late King Sari and, minister, the, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Joint Criminal Enterprise. The trial chamber found that by the 17th of April 1975 and continuing until at least the 6th of January 1979, Kirsten shared the common purpose of rapidly implementing socialist revolution in Cambodia through a, quote, greed leap forward, unquote. According to the trial chamber, this common purpose was criminal because it was intrinsically linked to policies that involved the commission of crimes. These policies were, one, the establishment and operation of cooperatives and work sites, two, the establishment of and operation of security centers and execution sites, three, the targeting of specific groups, and four, the regulation of marriage. The trial chamber further determined that Kilson Pond made a significant contribution to the commission of crimes perpetrated by CPK cadres within the scope of K002-02, and that he shared the intent of other senior leaders in a joint criminal enterprise to participate in and commit the crimes encompassed by the common purpose. The trial chamber accordingly found Kirsten guilty of committing through a JCE genocide a crimes against humanity and grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Kirsten Pond submits that the trial chamber made several errors of law and fact in defining the common purpose of the senior leaders of DK as criminal. He disputes the application of a criminal label to each of the ECVK's policy. He further contends that the trial chamber erred when it found that he both shared the criminal aspect of the common purpose and significantly contributed to it, as well as in finding that he intended to participate in the common purpose and in the crimes underlying it. Some of the legal errors alleged by Kilson Pond concerning the trial chamber's statement of the law applicable to JCE, for instance, he submits among other things, that culpable omission is not sufficient to establish participation in a common purpose and that the requisite link must be between a JCE member 
and all direct perpetrators of a crime, and not just one such perpetrator. For reason explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court chamber dismisses Kim Sung Paul's assertions in this regard as they fail to demonstrate any appealable error. Criminality of the common purpose. Kim Sung Paul repeatedly objects to how the trial chamber concluded that the CPK's plan for socialist revolution was criminal in nature. The Supreme Court Chamber recalls <coughs> that in order to give rise to criminal liability, the common purpose, that is the object of the planned action among several persons, must be of a criminal character in this sense that it either amounted to or involved the commission of a crime. Kirsten claims that a common purpose of rapidly implementing socialist revolution in Cambodia was not criminal in nature, but rather was a purely political move. That characterization ignores the fact that the underlying plan was to use any means necessary to achieve the socialist revolution in the country, including the crimes that were committed on a massive scale against the Cambodian people throughout the impl implementation process. The chamber considers that by no stretch of the imagin imagination could it be seriously stated that the CPK revolution was implemented in a benevolent or altruistic manner. While there may have existed socialist revolutions that have taken place without bloodshed or criminal activity, this, one, this was not one of them. Kilsen Pong claims of error regarding the trial chamber's approach in determining the criminality of the common pur purpose are accordingly dismissed. Kilsen Pong further submits that the trial chamber misconceived the CPK's notion of enemies and wrongly established the existence of a policy to eliminate them at security centers and execution sites. He asserts that the trial chamber's error precluded the conclusion that crimes against humanity were committed at, S20, at the S21, Krang Ta Chan, Okan Sang, and Phnom Krao Security Center, and repeatedly asserts that the trial chamber fails to, re to view the evidence in its proper context, namely that of armed hostilities against the Lumno regime and subsequently Vietnam. This chamber thoroughly reviewed the evidence with respect to the trial chamber's approach to real and perceived enemies of the CPK and concludes that Kilsenpon arguments are without foundation. The errors alleged by him as to the trial chamber's finding regarding the existence and uh, criminality of a policy to establish and operate security center and execution site during the DK era are thus dismissed. With respect to establishing cooperatives and work sites, Kilsen Pond disputes the trial chamber conclusion that this policy was intrins intrinsically linked to the common purpose and involved 
the commission of crimes against humanity. He contends inter alia that the trial chamber mischaracterized the CBK's political orientation regarding the cooperatives by selectively reviewing official CBK documents through an incriminating lens of, quote, enmity. And, quote, and ignoring exculpatory evidence demonstrating that there was a constrained concern for the population. While it is not necessary to refer to every piece of evidence on the trial record, the trial chamber did, in fact, refer to most of the documents to which Kilsom Pond points and his alternative interpretations of those documents do not suffice to overcome the trial chamber's conclusions based on its own fair and reasonable interpretation and those same documents. His allegations of error regarding the existence and criminality of a policy to establish and operate, operate cooperatives and work sites during the DK era are thus dismissed. Policy of targeting specific groups and regulating marriage. Turning to policy of target targeting specific groups, the Supreme Court Chamber concludes that Kilsampon has not demonstrated that the trial chamber erred in finding that a policy broadly targeted Buddhist, Cham, Vietnamese, and former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials for the reasons explained in full in the full written judgment. As to the policy of regulating marriage, Kirsten Pond submits that it was not possible to find the existence of a criminal policy regarding the organization of forced marriage and the commission of rape in this context. For reasons explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court Chambers has rejected his assertions, his allegations of error in the findings regarding the existence and criminality of a policy to regulate marriage during the DK era are thus dismissed. Kirsten contribution, the two remaining essential JCE issues relate to Kirsten contribution to and intend to participate in the common criminal purpose. He submits that the trial chamber wrongly found that his support for and participation in and or contribution to the political process for the purpose of implementing a socialist revolution in Cambodia were sufficient to establish his significant contribution to the commission of any crimes such purpose may have involved. The Supreme Court Chamber recalls that the contribution to a JCE may take many forms and as previously determined by the Chamber, quote, even activities that are on their face and related to the commission of crimes may be taken into account when determining whether the accused made a significant contribution thereto. Unquote. The Supreme Court Chamber accordingly rejects Kilsom Pond's argument that the trial chamber could not take into account his activities 
that were on their face directed at implementing a socialist revolution as proposed as opposed to the commission of specific crimes when determined determining that he made a significant contribution to furthering the JCE common criminal purpose. The Supreme Court chamber similarly rejects Q. Sampong's submission that the trial chamber essentially imposed on him a form of collective responsibility, quote unquote, or guilt by association, claiming that the trial judgment clearly shows that it based its conclusions about his significant contribution to the JCE on his own conduct or acts as opposed to those of others. Q. Sompon's allegations of error regarding his significant contribution to the JCE's common criminal purpose are thus dismissed. Q. Sompon's knowledge and intent as to whether he knew of and intended the commission of the crimes underlying the encompassed by the common purpose, Kilsampon disputes the trial chamber finding that he did and reiterates that the common purpose was not criminal. Kilsampon does not deny that he and the other members of the enterprise shared a common intent of transforming Cambodia into a, a self-sufficient classless agricultural society through a socialist revolution. But he continues to assert that they never intended to commit crimes individually, individually or as a group, and that their common purpose was benign and for the benefit of the population of Cambodia. He argues that any crimes that might have occurred in the process of implementing the common purpose were extraneous thereto and happened without his knowledge and participation. A review of the trial judgment shows that the trial chamber fully examined and applied the mens rea requirement of the JCE for each of the crimes alleged. Moreover, it, conclude, it conducted this exercise in relation to Kilsampong's imputed knowledge as a senior leader and active participant at the heart of the CPK and his close relationship with those at the highest level of its leadership. Contrary to his assertion that the trial chamber improperly imposed a, quote, vicarious criminal liability, unquote, on him, the Supreme Court chamber finds that the trial chamber inferred his intent from his own acts and conduct. The Supreme Court Chamber observes that in concluding that Kiel Sompon had the requisite mens rea under JCE, the trial chamber clearly concluded that he had direct contemporaneous knowledge of the commission of crimes and shared the intent for their commission with other JCE members. The several errors that Q. Sompon alleged with respect to the trial chamber's findings regarding his contemporary, con contemporaneous knowledge and the shared intent to commit crimes at cooperatives and work sites at security centers and against specific groups, namely the Jam, Buddhist, Vietnamese, and former Khmer Republic officials are dismissed for reasons explained in the full written judgment.
The Supreme Court Chamber similarly rejects Kilson Paul's assertion that the trial chamber erred in concluding that he knew of and intended to commit crimes in regulating marriage. The Supreme Court Chamber has addressed in the full written judgment Kiel Sampong's arguments in support of these contentions. For the most part, they simply constitute alternative interpretation of the evidence. Kiel Sampong's assertion of error are thus dismissed. Applicability of JCE liability to crimes committed with Douglas eventually. As a final JCE related matter, the Supreme Court Chamber has determined a uh, proprio motu that the trial chamber erred in its application of the law relating to JCE liability for, com for crimes committed with Dolius, Dolus eventualis, eventualis. Although none of the parties advanced uh, this issue on appeal, the Supreme Court Chamber considers it necessary to address as it is of general significance to the ECCC's jurisprudence. The trial chamber determined, quote, that the degree of intent required under JCE 1 is direct intent, unquote, and that, quote, indirect intent or dolus eventualis. Again, the trial chamber determined, quote, that the degree of intent required under JCE 1 is direct intent, unquote, and that, quote, indirect intent, dolus eventualis does not suffice for a finding of JCE before the ECC, unquote. As a result, the trial chamber concluded that a crime against humanity of murder committed with dollars eventually fell outside the common purpose of the JCE and accordingly and accordingly analyzed Kim Sampong's responsibility for this crime under the mode of liability of aiding and abetting instead. The Supreme Court Chamber concludes that the trial chamber erred when it failed to apply our holding in K002-01 that an accused may be held liable for crimes that are not directly intended but are nevertheless encompassed within a JCE common purpose. In this respect, the Supreme Court Chamber recalls its finding in case 002 01 that liability under JCE for crimes that fail outside the common purpose, that is JCE 3, was not part of customary international law in 1975 and that liability under JCE before the ECCC could therefore only arise for crimes falling within the common purpose. The trial chamber incorrectly concluded that if the commission of a crime is barely foreseeable, that crime automatically fail, falls outside the <coughs> common purpose. This ignores situations where the probable commission of a crime was jointly and willingly agreed upon or accepted by all JCE participants. In such situations, as the JCE participants share an agreement regarding the commission of a crime with dollars eventually in furtherance of the common purpose, the crime is encompassed by the common purpose.
The trial chamber's error led to led it to determine that murders committed with dollars eventually at the following location fell outside the JCE common purpose. The Trumpcock Cooperatives, the first January dam worksite, the Trumpcock Mall dam worksite, the Kampung Chenang Airfield construction site, the S21 Security Center, the Krang Chan Security Center, and the Phnom Krao Security Center. The trial chamber determined that Kizom Pond was instead culpable for aiding and abetting those murder with dollars eventually. For reasons explained in the full written judgment, the Supreme Court Chamber find, finds that the crime against humanity of murder with dollars eventually at these locations was encompassed by the JCE's common purpose and that Kilsom Pond made a significant contribution thereto with the shared intent to commit this crime while being aware of the substantial likelihood of deaths. Plum Crowd Security Center is excluded from this analysis because, as previously discussed, the Supreme Court Chamber reversed the trial chamber finding that the crimes against humanity of murder was established with respect to that location. The Supreme Court Chamber accordingly recharacterizes the form of liability from aiding and abetting to JCE for the crime against humanity of murder, of murder with donors eventually at, Tram, at the Tramcock Cooperatives, 1st January Dam Worksite, Shopiang Tmall Dam Worksite, Kampung Shnang Airfield Construction Site, S21 Security Center, and Krang Tachan Security Center. It therefore will not consider Kyosom Pong's remaining challenges related to aiding and abetting. Sentencing. The Supreme Court Chamber recalls that Kyosom Pong currently serves a life sentence. The maximum sentence permitted at the ECCC which was imposed by the trial chamber in case 002-01 and upheld by the Supreme Court Chamber on Appeal. Case 002-01 and 002-02 were prosecuted separately but originated from a single indictment that was severed in the interest of trial management and in light of the frail health and advanced age of all the accused. Although the two cases are thus related, they deal with different facts that were adjudicated in two trials that produced separate dispo dispositions each of which requires the imposition of a separate sentence after a finding of guilt. For this reason, the trial chamber sentenced Kiyosam Pon to life imprisonment for the crimes of which he was convicted in case 002-02, and we affirm that sentence the Supreme Court Chamber considers the life sentence that was imposed in case 002-02 to be appropriate in light of all the circumstances, including the tragic nature of the underlying events and the extent of harm caused by Kiev Sampon. In the circumstances, however, in addition to affirming the life sentence in this case, we affirm the decision of the trial chamber to have the sentence run concurrently with the one 
imposed in case 002-01 as permitted by Article 138 of the Cambodian Criminal Code. Nonetheless, Kirsten Pond has raised several challenges to the fairness of the sentence imposed by the trial chamber in case 002-02. He argues that the trial chamber erred in describing the primary objective of sentencing, that it erred in its assessment of the gravity of the crimes by including in its analysis a crime for which he was not charged, that it erred in its assessment of aggravating factors, including the double counting of his positions of authority and influence as an aggravating factor as to the gravity of the crimes, and finally, that it erred in assessing mitigating factors. The Supreme Court Chamber has thoroughly considered each of these assertions and considers them without merit. The sole exception is the claim that the trial chamber erred in both assessing the gravity of the crimes committed by including a crime of which Kirsten Porn was not charged and impermissibly double counting his position of authority and influence. Although the Supreme Court Chamber decides that doing so constituted error, it also concludes that in the circumstance of this case, their consideration does not render the ultimate sentence inappropriate or unfair in any way. This position, for the foregoing reasons, the Supreme Court Chamber, pursuant to Article 41B of the ECCC Agreement, and it calls 14 new 1B and 36 new of the ECCC law and internal rule 111, noting the respective written submissions of the parties on appeal and their arguments presented at the hearing from 16 to 19 August. 2021 grants in part and dismisses in part Kiel Sampon's appeal and therefore insofar as it relates to facts of death that occurred at Tram Co Cooperatives Trapeng Tmo Dam Worksite, 1st January Dam Worksite, Kampung Chnang Airfield Construction Site, S21 Security Center, and Krang Tachan Security Center. Reverses Kiel Sampon's conviction for aiding and abetting the crime against humanity of murder with dollars eventualis and recategorizing the facts. Enters a conviction for the crime against humanity of murder with dollars eventualis through a joint criminal enterprise. Insofar as it relates to facts of death that occurred at Phnom Krau Security Center, reverses Kiel Pond's conviction for the crime against humanity or murder at Phnom Krau Security Center, insofar as it relates to facts of persecution at 1st January Dam Worksite, reverses Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of persecution on political grounds of new people at the 1st January Dam Worksite.
Insofar as it relates to facts of killing of the charm that occurred at Tree Village and Wat O Trokun, and killings of the Vietnamese in Swai Rieng, in Nikke Waters, in Kampung Chinang Province, at Wat Ksach and in Krati, as well as at O Consign Security Center, affirms Kiel Pons conviction for the crimes against humanity of extermination insofar as they relate to facts of forced labor of prisoners at Phnom Crowd Security Center, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crime against humanity of enslavement. Insofar as they relate to facts of removal of the Vietnamese from Tram Kok district and from Brevain province, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of deportation of Vietnam Vietnamese. Insofar as they relate to the facts of physical and mental mistreatment of the charm at Tree Village, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crime against humanity of torture. Insofar as they relate to the facts of the treatment of the charm and of real or perceived enemies of the CPK, including former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials and new people and tram co cooperatives Dropping more them work site, first January them work site, not in relation to new people. Kampung Chinang Airfield Construction Site, S21 Security Center, Grand Tachan Security Center, O Consign Security Center, and Phnom Krao Security Center, affirms Kim Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of persecution on political grounds. Insofar as they relate to facts of discrimination against the charm, affirms Kim Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of persecution on religious grounds. Insofar as they relate to facts of discrimination against Buddhist and Buddhist monks, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of persecution on religious grounds. Insofar as they relate to facts of discrimination on the Vietnamese at Trump Co Cooperatives, S21 Security Center, O Consign Security Center, and in Prevec and Swahirian provinces, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of persecution on racial grounds. Insofar as they relate to facts of disappearances at Tram Co Cooperatives, Grand Tachan Security Center and Phnom Krao Security Center, affirms Kirsten Pond's conviction for the crimes against humanity of other inhuman acts through conduct characterized as enforced disappearances. Insofar as they relate to facts of possible transfers of the charm. Insofar as they relate to facts of possible transfer of the charm in the course of the movement of population phase two, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of other in human acts through conduct characterized as forced transfer. Insofar as they relate to facts of forced marriage and forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage, Within the context of the nationwide regulation of marriage, affirms Kiel Sampon's conviction for the crimes against humanity of other inhuman acts through conduct characterized as forced marriage and rape, and additionally categorized as crime against humanity 
of other in human acts in the form of sexual violence understood to constitute forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage with regards to female victims grants the co-prosecutor's appeal and enters a conviction for the crime against humanity of other in human acts through conduct characterized as forced marriage and additionally categorized as crime against humanity of other in human acts in the form of sexual violence understood or to constitute forced sexual intercourse in the context of forced marriage with regard to male victims. Insofar as they relate to willful killing, torture, in human treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, willfully depriving prisoners of war or civilians the rights of fair and regular trial, and the unlawful confinement of civilians affirms kill some pawns conviction for grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Insofar as they relate to the facts of killings of the Vietnamese, affirms Kiss and Pons conviction for the crime of genocide, affirms Kiss and Pons sentence of life imprisonment, in case 002-02, which so run concurrently with the life sentence imposed in case 002-01. Orders that Kiel Sampon remained in the custody of the ECCC pending the issuance of the full written appeal judgment and the finalization of arrangements for his transfer in accordance with the law to the prison where he will continue to serve his sentence. 60 officers, please take the accused back to his cell. The chamber declares the closure of the pronouncement. All rise.